Hey everyone, welcome to this. I'm your host, Shauna Griffiths. And today we're doing a really, really special episode. Um, we're gonna veer a little bit away from what we traditionally do here. Um, and I'm super, super grateful to introduce you all to a dear friend, extended family, extended family of mine, uh, Merle Code. So Merle, thank you so much for joining us today. As an extended family member, I had no choice but to join. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're going to get in trouble if you did it. Um, <laughs> so, so folks, you may know um, Merle, quite frankly, from the headlines um, from the last several years. Um, I know Merle from a very dear friend of mine. She's been a best friend since I was like 10 when we were playing basketball, um, you know, in, in Michigan. And Audra Miller has, is also an advisor um, of SLG Impact, and she has been a supporter of me throughout my entire life. Um, and so I know Merle um, to be an incredibly authentic, genuine leader in life and leader in his community. Um, and again, you may have heard of him from the headlines, um, you know, the center of the FBI college basketball scandal. Um, and I think that was back in 2017, um, around that time. And one of the three main defendants um, who actually came, went to take his case to trial. Um, and also the person who's facing um, some prison time, uh, nine months that would start any day. Um, so the fact that you're here today and you're giving us your time, Merle, I just am, am so incredibly grateful. Um, I will also say, um, you know, a big reason why I wanted to talk with you is I admire the way you're using your voice and coming forward. Um, he's also an author, folks. He has a book that we'll talk about this episode uh, called Black Market. Um, it's a Harper Collins book. So it'll be out and available for you to be buying in March. I can't wait to read it. Um, so lots of things. He's also a father. So, so Lots of good things for us to, to get into. And, you know, again, I just wanted to pause and, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, so, so we'll jump right into it. So tell us first, Merle, give us a bit of your background, your evolution in the game of basketball, if you would. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and as to your listeners, uh, Shauna is extended family through my cousin, who is one of my best friends and, and Audra again is, is, is the reason for this relationship, not for the call. The call is, is, is you. <laughs> so Shauna and Audra have been attached to hip for years and Audra is one of my favorite people on earth. And therefore Shauna has become extended family. So <laughs> my pleasure to be here with you today. Um, my evolution really started um, when I started playing a game around seven and and really developed a passion and love for the game during the summer months spent in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, huh. I saw some incredibly talented guys every summer um, and wanted to be those guys, wanted to, wanted to see how my skills from one summer to the next compared and, and could mm -hmm. I compete and just fell in love with the game and <clears throat> really developed a passion for wanting to be good at, at it. Yeah. Um, that, that lended itself to me becoming a pretty good player at the high school level. Um, I then went to prep school at Fort Union Military Academy um, for a, a post-grad year and uh, then ended up at Clemson University and played there for four years and um, played in the CBA and then went to Europe and I was with the Denver Nuggets for a hot cup of coffee during training <laughs> camp and um, spent some time in, in Europe. Um, and, and in other parts of the world. Um, and so uh, transitioned out of my playing career into being a consultant at Nike. Mm -hmm. uh, and from a consultant to a manager, I'm sorry, consultant to a shoe rep. Okay. Uh, shoe rep to a manager, manager to a director. So I kind of oh. worked my way up the food chain over the course of my 12 plus years um, at, at, at Nike and then transitioned out of Nike um, and then became a consultant at Adidas in 2015-ish, somewhere mm -hmm. in there, 15, 15, 16, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And um, again, doing my job and thought I was doing my job and what I was tasked to do uh, yeah. as a consultant. And that landed me, landed the FBI, surrounded my home with guns and uh, uh, landed me in the courtroom and facing prison time. Jesus. 
Well, so so let's talk about this for a second that dedication to the game and and the I mean because as I know it, you were so instrumental to in over like a couple of decades into some of the biggest names in the game getting from you know in their journey throughout their careers. Like you had your career again, you made a transition, um, and so as I've known it, part of your passion and dedication is giving back to the game and giving back to the community and. Um, so I'd love to kind of hear about that, but also related to, I really want to know what it, did you understand your job to be? You were doing your job. Yeah. So, so the game, again, I, I'm, I'm dedicated to game in a, in, in a lot of different, um, from a lot of different vantage points. I mean, so there's, obviously there's the, the, the aspect of learning to work at the game from a skill perspective, right? So that, mm-hmm. that is how many jump shots are you working on your ball handling, um, are you studying film? You know, those those aspects of the game. Um, and that's part of how you give back is just taking mm-hmm. those um, those lessons that you've had and, and trying to give it to a younger generation. Things that I was mm-hmm. taught in college, you want to take a middle school or high school kid and start teaching them those things, right? So that mm-hmm. they can be better than you were. Um, so you always want to try to elevate the game and the people coming behind you. Um, the other piece is, again, the educational piece um, in terms of, of giving back um, from a business perspective and helping people understand the business of sports, mm-hmm. understand their value and what they bring to a particular business entity and how those deals should be structured. We are not um, we are not front and center, let me say it that way, as it relates to how the business operates. Um, mm-hmm. We typically, and I say we, and, I, and again, it, it really bothers me at times, but I'm I need to bring it to the forefront in terms of the the, the, the racial disparities and that that exist. Mm-hmm. The community um, doesn't typically get exposed to the, the business at this level um, until sometimes it's too late and they're they've been taken advantage of. Yeah. Um, because they didn't know any better. And right. so part of what I also try to do is educate those again from the experiences that I had to try mm-hmm. to again create that that shield, that wall of protection to say, hey. You might want to think about doing this or, hey, this is how this works or, Mm -hmm. no, those percentages are kind of out of whack. You know, this is kind of the industry standard in terms of how um, royalties work or percentages Mm -hmm. on marketing contracts work or, you know, those things are are discussionary points that need to be um, a part of that educational process. Um, And again, I think the last piece is the humanistic piece, educating people, you know, in our circles to learn to, to help each other. Yeah, we don't help each other enough. And the problem with my situation is that I was I was trying to help. And, mm-hmm. and so the question the question you posed was, what was my job? Well, the job in that space is to acquire assets for brands, mm-hmm. uh, assets being athletes um, and relationships and the ability to influence those athletes for whatever the desired goal is so that they win, you win, the school wins. And ultimately, they become an endorser of your product. You mm-hmm. know, so, so it's the system is supposed to be um, where everyone has an equitable stake in, mm-hmm. in in the successes. That's not how it works, though. How mm-hmm. it actually works is the kids at the university and collegiate levels are the workforce, and those who make the decisions are the ones who benefit the most um, from their labors, and those kids get nothing. And the people will say, well, they got a free education. It's not free, one, uh, because these kids put their minds and bodies through all kinds of things that the general public has no idea um, of what they go through. They don't know the mental and physical abuse that these kids endure throughout Mm -hmm. their college careers. And it's easy because now you can look online and through, you know, your Google searches and find where this young man has been He's gotten death threats because he didn't play well in the, in the game last night. Um, it's easy to see how now, you know, these 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 huge gambling sites are now striking deals with NCAA and 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 these universities. And wait a minute, they're gambling on my abilities and they're making money and I can't. Right. You know, and so it's just it's kind of this it, it's an evolution of corruption at the at, at the business level mm. and the impacted the most are the kids who are the ones putting forth the effort and energy and putting their lives on the line because again right. Shauna the problem with this is the humanistic piece is missing some of these young men have 
and, and young women have children. Yeah. They can't feed them. They don't have mm -hmm. the money to take care of them. Some of these young men and young women have families who've never seen them play because yeah. they can't afford to get there. They can't afford, and if they get there, they can't afford to stay, they can't afford to eat. Yeah. Um, they, they, they do a disservice to these young men and women by putting them in, in um, garbage majors, mm. uh, general studies, yeah. um, uh, coaching education, um, physical education, uh, parks, recreation, and tourism management. You know, all these goo gob that aren't really majors so that they'll stay eligible yeah. um, to perform mm -hmm. so that they can make money. And they bend the rules when it's necessary to fit their agenda. If it, you went to the University of Michigan, if the if the average SAT score is 1,100, and you have to have a 3.5 to get into the University of Michigan, but that athlete has a 2.0 and a 700, and he can really run a football, he's mm -hmm. gonna get in. Yeah. And so, and then you then you stick them in a school where they're not academically equipped to compete, and then when they hurt themselves or they're no longer of use. You mm -hmm. throw him to the world. Yeah. And now that kid has a busted up knee, back, neck for the rest of his life. And because he wasn't able to earn anything while he was playing at your university, he now has to fend for himself in the real world. Mm -hmm. And those insurance bills and doctor bills are coming. I think that there's too often times people forget the disparity of the backgrounds of some of the people who these athletes who are playing. And it's not, you know, everybody didn't come along the same way and have the same things. And so that also means that as they continue on, they don't have all those things either. We glorify those who make it, right? We glorify yeah. the small percentage of, of, of athletes who can elevate from high school to college, college to professional and mm -hmm. become of, of global or iconic status. And those kids who don't make it, which is the majority, right? Yeah. You're talking, you know, there's, I think there's 3%, right? 3% mm -hmm. of the kids will make or have an opportunity to play professionally. It's one percent that made it to the NBA, um, but that other ninety-seven to ninety-nine percent are, are folks who are going to have to go find a job. And mm -hmm. if you're not equipped um, to, to to really enter the workforce, <laughs> you know, because you haven't really learned while you were in school, or you weren't able to maximize the the, the, the profitability of your of your talents, then you you've really you're, you've you've operated at a loss, right? And so if we really and truly live in a capitalist society, then why am I being capped on being able to earn for my abilities? Right. This name, image, and likeness yeah. is a facade. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. And I'm still having to ask someone as an athlete. Yeah. I say, I, I'm saying athletes right. continue to have to ask, can they use their name? Can they use their image? Can they use their likeness for profitability? Mm -hmm. I have to ask. Right. That's, that's indenture slavery. Hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. And you don't cap that science student who's on science scholarship. You don't oh, force right. it into a name, image, and likeness deal. <laughs> you don't have the states, you know, lining up to come up with their own state rules as it relates to name, image, and likeness deals. State of Georgia can take 70% of these kids' monies and redistribute those monies how they see fit. What? Yeah. Right. They cap agency agent fees in states so that it discourages agents from wanting to bring deals to kids because it minimizes the money they can make. So there's mm -hmm. all these different obstacles right. being put into play because the general public now says, oh, well, they fixed the problem. Mm -hmm. Well, not every kid is going to have a sponsorship deal at the college level. Yeah. And so, no, you haven't fixed the problem. You've definitely made it a nice PR story. Mm -hmm. But you haven't fixed the issue. Mm -hmm. And so you can't say that there's there's fairness in the game when the worker force isn't being compensated. And again, I'm not necessarily saying that every kid should get a paycheck week to week. What I am saying is some some percentage, some algorithm, some formula yeah. of all of the monies that they, they generate um, from an athletic perspective should be redistributed to all of those kids, whether it be in the form of an IRA, mm -hmm. some kind of trust account, something that says, listen, every year that you compete and play for our school, we're going to do this so that you have a head start in life. So right. if, you, if you do have health issues, 
you have something to help you get through it because you were a meaningful part of our revenue generating business. Right. No different than a retirement account. Right. Yeah. That that's what should happen. Mm. Not this. Well, we'll take the, 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 the famous, you know, in a high profile quarterback and he's making good jobs money, but the guy who isn't playing as much, he's still on scholarship. He's not getting that. He's not getting an opportunity to earn off of his abilities. Right. Right. So, um, every kid should have that, have that opportunity. Right. So, so in your role, you were really used for your ability to, and I say use, I didn't actually mean it that way, but it's a little no, bit of a, <laughs> a double into it, right? Um, is like for your ability to leverage your relationships that you had. And I think that one thing that I heard you say at one point was about that you believe relationships are transformational, not transactional. Yeah, and um, that's been, I've tried to live my life. My, my life has really been, and I say this, I'm not a rich dude, right? I'm around yeah. multimillionaires, you know, on a regular in the business, whether that yeah. be coaches or, or players who, who sign multi-million dollar deals. Well, mm-hmm. I was making 150 grand a year. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. my relationships were not um, transactional. They, right. I tried to make my relationships transformative. Mm-hmm. And trans- oh, right, and that... I want to see those guys get to that place. I right. want to see those guys be able to utilize their skills to get to those $100 million deals, right? Mm-hmm. Because those are the kinds of guys that can change the, the economic gap that exists. Mm-hmm. Those are the kinds of folks that you hope will pass those life lessons and their, their knowledge on to the next generation of young man and young woman. And then hopefully we can start leveling the gap. That's mm-hmm. the hope, right? And so if I, if I can't do it from... A financial place, I can certainly do it from an educational and experience standpoint. Right. And so, I, again, my my role was to utilize my background as a player, my ability to communicate, um, my experiences um, on the business side, mm-hmm. to formulate relationships with these up and coming players. Again, for the benefit of the brand that I was working for. Right. Yep. So you and weren't an that, agent. That levels right right other brand yep um, at, the, at the brand level in terms of selling t-shirts and, and shoes yeah but also at the level of the the, the sponsorship relationship between the university and the shoe company mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so so that's the point you weren't an agent you weren't working for university you were employed by you're in the shoe game you're working for a, a company corporate in corporate america yep. and there you and you think you're doing your job and then you're fighting for your freedom. And, you know, and in doing so, my understanding is that you decided not to turn on other people and you were exactly actually excited for your trial because you thought, all right, well, here's where I can go and prove. Mm -hmm. And then you couldn't bring your evidence. So, so talk about, talk about that dynamic. Yeah. So, (laughs) it was a lot because you know again you're working for you're working at the behest of a company um and so it's for your people who don't know the story Mm -hmm. um a quick synopsis right a young man in christian dawkins who was an aspiring um sports manager um had access to some players and relationships um i had formulated a relationship with christian he's a younger guy he's in his early early to mid 20s um and i was kind of a pseudo uncle to him because he was getting started he needed Mm -hmm. to earn certain things know certain people he was kind of finding his way in in the space but a talented articulate smart you know funny 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 dude christian um, approaches me and says hey man i've got a young man by the name of brian bowen who's a really talented player and i'd actually seen the kid play Mm -hmm. Uh, but i do not know this young man i've never met this young man i don't know his family i don't know him um but, but Christian approaches me and says, hey, I've got this kid, Brian Bowen. I said, yeah, I've seen that kid play. He's, pretty, he's a good player. He said, well, you know, family's house burned down. Dad and mom really want to move to whatever city that the kid is going to play in. Yeah. I think Adidas would help if he ends up going to an Adidas school. And I was like, I don't know, man, not my money. I don't, yeah. I don't make decisions. But what I'll do is pass your request on to the guys that I work for, and we'll see what happens. So I passed the request on. Um, and 
the powers that be at the company I was consulting with and the powers that be at Louisville came back and said, yes, we want Adidas to help us. So they came back with a number of $100,000. That's what the dad was asking for in terms of his ability to move his family and okay. seek residence in Louisville. Um, and so again, from, a, from an Adidas perspective, it gives them a leg up in terms of an advantage because they've done something for the kid and his family. So if he becomes okay. a pro, he's more apt than likely to sign with them as a company. That's how the system works. Um, I get a call from the guys that I work for at Adidas and say, hey, we need you to submit an invoice because they've okayed the deal. Why am I submitting an invoice? Well, this is the way that we normally do it. We do it through mm. travel programs. Okay, this is how you normally do it, fine. Um, I submit an invoice and then I have 20 FBI officers with guns locked and loaded knocking at my door. Wow. Yeah. That's what happened. And then I get charged with defrauding the same university that's asking for the help. And I was like, oh. okay, that's ridiculous because I have, you guys have been wiretapping my phone. I have right. transcribed phone calls. I have text messages. Like I have all kinds of things that mm -hmm. don't prove. that's not the case. This is a partnership. Right. And I can prove that. Well, then you get into the courtroom and the judge says, well, first of all, we're not going to talk about poor black kids in my courtroom. Oh. And secondly, um, none of the evidence that you have is going to be admitted for the, jury's, for the jury to hear. So now you become a sitting duck in terms of the government's narrative versus the yeah. truth. Yeah. And so they're it's able to prove their case because they only got to hear the government side of the story. Right. And they right. wouldn't even allow. So, and here's the crazy piece. We tried to subpoena the coaches and athletic directors to the stand and they blocked, the judge blocked all of our requests to have oh, the wow. stand. Wow. At one point in time in the trial, Shauna, one of our attorneys said to the compliance, because that's what they put on the stand with the compliance people, NCAA compliance people who had no idea of any of this, right? Uh -huh. Put them on the stand and one of our lawyers said, well, so tell me when you called the government to, to say you've been defrauded. Objection. Because they, there wasn't a phone call from the compliance to, to the government to say they've been defrauded. The government manufactured this narrative oh, wow. took it to the schools. And then they got on board saying, well, we didn't know the compliance folks. Said, well, anyway, we didn't know anything about it. And then the judge says, well, if the president and the board of trustees don't know this is going on, it's so like, come on, man, get out of here. The president doesn't know any of these kids on the football team. The board of trustees don't know any of these, how the recruiting process works. This is a mess. And so you guys allow a manipulated narrative and me to be convicted off of a lie versus really digging into this and getting to the bottom of it. Because then they found out they would be damaging the same folks that they said had been, uh, had been defrauded. You know what I mean? Like the, if, if, the, if, if the truth really came out, they'd be damaging those same schools that said had been defrauded because now it all comes out about what the coach's requests were and the athletic department's requests were of the sponsorship, mm -hmm. of the sponsor um, uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned, earlier you mentioned something about the racial injustice and then you mentioned what the judge said. And I'm glad that you brought that up because there's been a thread as I've been following that gets me every time what is from my perception feels like racial injustice where you have what was the stat right like eight of the nine people who were charged were people of color were black people yeah, is that nine, something like that right nine of the ten yeah absolutely. something like that yeah. you know and then it, there's all these things that are woven through this and so it just yeah. even i you know i think i've heard stuff about like people who were um you know, like prosecuting the case and stuff. There's all these like racial elements of it. And I think like, you know, we all know what's been going on in this world, especially in like the last, the you know, the last couple of years and all of that. And I don't think that stuff can be overlooked. So, you know, I appreciate that you, that you referenced it. And, you know, and it's also like those head coaches that the majority of them weren't black and, you know, they're off. I believe they're not being punished. Is that correct? Yeah. So the way that the system really works is most black guys are assistant coaches because mm. they are not viewed as head coaching material. They're viewed as recruit recruiters. Um, so, so what we do, what, what happens is you have the black assistant coach who's responsible to go get black kids 
from black neighborhoods mm -hmm. to, to the white coach to the white university so that the white coach and the white university can make money. That's mm -hmm. how the system works. Okay. And so yeah, when this whole case came down, um, the only folks that got in trouble were the black assistant coaches. The white head coaches who they had on wiretaps, who, mm -hmm. who, who they had um, making offers to kids, they weren't prosecuted, we were. Um, and so yeah, there's a lot of racial overtone as it relates yeah. to this. Um, but again, this is this is America, and that's how that's how black men has have historically been treated in this in this country. Yeah, there is so much work to be done, um, and you know, again, that's part of why I we talk about on this show real talk and re real leaders, because I think you know it's just about bringing these bringing these things forward and and talking about them in real ways. Um, and, and part of that is, is finding voice. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But, but before we do, I want to touch on something that we also talk about a lot here is your mental game. And I can imagine that these last several years have been trying, is, I don't even know how, what the word is, but incredibly difficult. And so I'm curious, you know, a lot of times I talk about different tools to help yourself stay centered and grounded. And, and I'm curious, like through this all, how are you, how are you able to you know, I can't say keep it together mentally, but like, how do you keep your mental game together? And, you know, you're looking at nine months ahead of you. Any, mm -hmm. any plans for thoughts about how you're going to keep your self yeah, together I think, mentally? I think the, 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 and I shouldn't say the beauty, I think the advantage that I have is again, I've been an athlete. And mm -hmm. so I've had to push myself through when you didn't think you could push through anymore. Right. And so when, when, when your body's telling you, you can't, you know, run one more lap. Um, you can't run one more hill. Yeah. You can't guard another 10 seconds. You know, you've had to push through and find a way to um, conquer those obstacles, whatever they may be. And so I think mentally, because I've experienced so much as a black man, mm -hmm. um, as an athlete, um, as a father, um, as a husband, I know what it's like to, I've seen guys go to prison for, for garbage before and it's, yeah. it's my turn, right? And I hate mm. to say it that way because not every black man will experience that, but that's typical. And, and, and I say this with all due respect, but there's, there's guys who've been electrocuted and died for, not, for things that they didn't do, who look like me. Um, there's been gentlemen shot and killed um, for things that they didn't do. Um, mm. And so for no reason, just because someone had an a, a authority and power over them and they exerted it and they lost their lives. And so I, I have to look at this through a lot of different prisms. One is I'm a, a man of faith. So I don't feel like there's anything that a man can do to me that my God can't um, overcome. Okay. And so it's not an easy task because I've been, I have been persecuted the last four years. I have been called the boogeyman and an undesirable and corrupt. I've been called all kinds of things for simply trying to help a family. And that's okay. People are entitled to their opinion, but it doesn't stop me from really getting to a place of determination. And that's what this has done. This is really more focused and determined to really share more of my story because the book gives you a good bit, but not yeah. all, right? Yeah. yeah. So I was angry going through the court process because again, I come from a, a family where my father was a, a was an attorney for 30 plus years and, and, right. a, and a judge. And to hear him frustrated to say, this is not how the court system is supposed to work was like, okay, I, now I know I'm getting screwed, right? right. Um, and he kept saying, man, the, as a judge, and I sat in that seat, man. You, you're supposed to be the referee. You're not supposed to be playing for the other side. And this is this is, wow, you know. And, and so, to hear him say that, let me know I was really in a dogfight. And whatever I was dealing with, he's like, man, listen. I wish I could could tell you this was going to be okay, man. But it's not. This is not good. And yeah. you're in a you're in a helpless space because you don't have any control to say, wait a minute. I have the proof and they don't care. Mm -hmm. They've created a narrative, they have to win. And that's all that matters to them is the win. The truth doesn't matter. 
And so that's the, that was the, I was angry. I'm not angry anymore. I'm really focused and I'm really determined. And that was part of why the book was so important to me. Right, right. Uh, Because it's the first step in creating a a national conversation. Yeah, yeah. And I think I'm, I'm glad you went to the book. So I was exactly where I was going to go. And, and, and I had mentioned this to you. I think like, as we go, as we mature in our lives, a lot of times we like have to find out, like, how do we use our voice? And I, you know, and how do you tell your, how your, your perspective and, and, you know, especially if something's going on that isn't, you know, you have an opposing opinion to, but, but it is not, a lot of people say it's not easy to find your voice. It's not easy to use your voice. And I think that you also reach a point where you're like, you know what, it is harder for me to be silent than to use my voice. And I think that's about like also exercising, like being a leader, being real, using your voice, telling your side. And so I just applaud you coming forward bravely as you have, you've got a book now it's called black market. Um, you know, and, and I just think it represents all those things. And, and you told me that it's not about you being vindictive, which I think is a really good thing. So, so tell our listeners a little bit more about that. Yeah, this, this book is not a, it's not a tell all in the sense of, Hey, they've done this to me. So I'm telling on you guys, that's, that serves no purpose for me. Um, Mm -hmm. again, because if I did that, the only people that would truly be negatively affected would probably be those same black assistant coaches that I'm speaking of, because what would happen is universities would have to find a fall guy. It wouldn't be the head coach who they're paying all this money to with a $15 million buyout. It would be the assistant coach making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Mm-hmm. And then they would tarnish his name and his career and his livelihood and his family would be impacted because of what I did. I'm not doing that. Right. So what I then did is says, you know what, I can tell my story and then I can use some of those real life situations and scenarios that your average everyday fan would have no idea actually exists in these kids' world um, and what these families go through and how I tried to help them. Whether you agree with the help or not, how I tried to help them, and I'm basically applauding them by saying, hey, man, wish you could have gotten more. Mm-hmm. You, your, your abilities um, put you in this position and it, you, 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 were, you were more valuable than than the industry would allow you to, to take advantage of. Um, and so it's not a vindictive kind of get, get to get to a point where I'm pointing a finger at anybody. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a look into my experiences as a player. Um, and again, that, that, that mental and physical abuse that kids take. And I, I go through my own story in that vein, from that vein. Um, I talk about my time and dealing with some of those situations and those kids and some of those unreal situations that you'll say, wait a minute, what happened? Yeah. Well, the point of the book, Shauna, really is to make you think, okay. to help you gain some understanding, um, to make you laugh, because there's some really funny stories in the book. And lastly, it's to piss you off. Like, I hope mm-hmm. that when, because I put um, some of those transcribed conversations in the book that oh, wow. were not allowed in the courtroom. And I'm just at a place where I'm, I'm not going to let anybody's um, narrative um, be what, what I know not to be true, right? I'm not mm-hmm. going to allow that to continue without me saying, hey, you can say it, but that's not true. Here's the truth. And I don't want it to just be verbal because mm-hmm. anybody can bat a lie by saying, well, that's not true. This is what happened. No, I'm going to do whatever I can from a visibility perspective to make sure that the truth is known. Mm, good. And again, that's what I mean about like using your voice and not letting it get twisted or, you know, and, and have been standing strong in your, in your voice. And you now, so you've got the book and you shared the impact that you're looking to make with that, which is, which is great. And I literally, I just can't wait to read it. Um, and then you're also coming out with that you've been working with a team on is an equitable um, event. And so um, I am really looking forward to hearing more about that. I know it's social justice awareness related, um, mm-hmm. inclusion element. So I know that is in the working. So I will keep um, the audience, I will keep you all on, you know, apprised of what's going on with that. Um, so that, you know, and there's a lot of brands and media and people from sports and marketing who are a part of this audience. So, you know, I, you know, I want people who are hearing it, who may have heard a different side of the story to 
get to know Merle and, and hear his side of it. And that was really important to me um, to have you here today for, for partly for that, Merle. Um, also, if you're listening and you're someone who's like feels compelled by the story, um, you know, again, this event that's going to come up is very much equitable, um, you know, an equitable focused event, social justice related. If you're a brand or someone who wants, you know, to know more, drop me a line um, and I can help out with that. Um, and also keep your eyes out for, for Merle's book. Um, and then, and we'll share a little bit of that on our blog as well. So I'm going to wrap this up with one thing. And that is to ask you, we spent some good time here together. Um, and what do you want? If there's one or two things that you want the audience to take away to know from this, um, what would that be? I hope that the dialogue that we have gives them some perspective. Um, and I hope that reading the book again carries you through those emotions that I mentioned. And I hope that the viewership starts looking at these young men and young women um, in the athletic space and really understanding the business around them and that they deserve an opportunity to be treated like everyone else in a capitalist society. All right. Well, you've got my absolute support as you go into your sort of next part of your journey here. Um, and I just can't thank you enough for the time you spent here and I wish you all the best. Thank you, dear. I appreciate you having me. Thanks so much.